I need to. We're doing now. Please let us know if you can hear us. Sounds okay. Yes, they can hear. Yes, 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 yes. I like those. Yes, it's like thumbs up. Okay, we're going back. Back to our presentation today. A pleasure to introduce a seminar by Julie Kutsia, who's just joined Saya with the Sartre Chair in Ecology and Management of Aquatic Invasive Species. And um, Julie, in her very impressive career, she has been focusing on understanding the fundamentals of the interactions between plant and insect through using approaches of biocontrol um, to mitigate the impact of invasive aquatic plants um, on the ecosystem. She completed her PhD in 2004, the big brother is watching us. <laughs> then she joined the Plant Protection Research Institute in Pretoria, and then she joined uh, uh, with similar research, Rhodes University. She is globally recognized. She's uh, got expertise in the management of in invasive aquatic plants, and currently she leads extensive biological control programs against uh, invasive aquatic uh, plants in South Africa. On top of this, she's a keen educator. She is known for her commitment to uh, train the next generation of environmental scientists. And she aims to uh, inspire students to engage with the complexity of invasions in aquatic ecosystems and instill that sense of responsibility for environmental stewardship. Um, just to add on to all of this, Julie's in Africa only, she's worked with uh, and collaborated with uh, in countries like Mozambique, Cameroon, Morocco. Recently, she's joined programs in Kenya and Zimbabwe, but also she's reaching out to other continents. She's got collaboration in Argentina, in New Zealand, where she develops through this collaboration, uh, the uh, biological control options. Julie also has set uh, um, as a president of the Entomological Society in Southern Africa over the last two years, and she's an associate editor for the Journal of Hydrobiologia, I would say Hydrobiologia. Um, and we, so we, all of this, we're so happy to have you, Julie, to start off this year and, and your settlement at SIA with this opening of this, um, of the seminar series. Thank you so much. So to squeeze through, I didn't want to upset the, the audio visuals. So thank you so much, um, everyone, for coming. Thanks, CBC. Um, great turnout. Mm -hmm. And thanks to everyone from SIAB. It's really great to be able to um, stand up and just give you an overview of the research that um, my group's been doing. So this isn't just me. This is um, the Center for Biological Control. Um, and it even goes back to the 90s, which is when I was in definitely not doing biological control. So really an overview of the, the water weeds um, work in South Africa and a bit of Africa. And then um, where are we going? I've just started, I've just taken up a, as Francesca said, a Saatchi chair. Um, I'm an invasive plant species person. I'm not an animal, um, a, a faunal invasion person. And so I'm really going to be relying on a lot of expertise from others to um, take this research chair forward. 
And this is a picture that I love to use because I took this um, in Kruger Park um, on the Makati Sprite, which is near Lataba. And um, there's always a pot of hippos there, whether there's water hyacinth or not. And then you can just sort of see them and be like, you know, what are you guys, what are you doing here? Are you getting rid of this? Or, And then a lot of people say, are these the biocontrol agents? <laughs> which generally they are not. We are not advancing. Okay. Okay. So an overview um, of Africa's worst floating macrophytes, and this also belongs to some other continents. And we Sorry, are, we're they, not unique. Graham Todd, like Dave is in. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Kelby. <laughs> Um, so we're looking at um, the most notorious water hyacinth that recently, recently had a name change that was Arconia crassipes, and we're now calling it Pontederia crassipes, giant salvinia, salvinia molesta, um, water lettuce, and parrot's feather. And these are the floating aquatic species that probably are the most notorious and cause the most amount of um, economic damage, environmental damage, um, and social damage to African ecosystems. And for example, this is Lake Victoria um, at the Kasumi Yacht Club in Kenya. This is a picture taken in 1996. And this is the lake. And as far as the eye can see, it's covered in water hyacinth. And as it is, there's always a lot of um, people wanting to help poor old Africa and so, in um, during this time, there were a lot of programs to harvest this weed. Um, you know, we've got these incredible machines. They can take the weeds out, but these weeds grow so very quickly that any amount of um, mechanical or manual removal does pretty much nothing because these plants can double um, their biomass in seven to 14 days. So as the plants are being removed, they're just growing and filling up the space that's been removed. And we still see this today. And the reason why I'm highlighting this is if you have a look here, it says Aquatic Weed Harvester Purposefully Built. And it won the Prince of Wales Award for Innovation in 1991. So this was sent from, from Europe or the UK. And in 98, this is what Kasumu still looked like. So why do we have these, why do these invasive species do this um, in the lands of introduction, where in their native ranges, they occur, they behave well, they co-occur with the native um, flora. Here at the Pantanal in Brazil, one of the areas where water hyacinth is um, native to, and in fact, all of those invasive species that I showed right at the beginning are native to, um, largely to the Amazon basin, they found in the Pantanal and also the Parana basin. And here you can see them sort of floating around quite happily with giant water lilies and not being a nuisance. So what's going on where they're introduced? Well, if we look at aquatic ecosystems, and I'm glad I'm in the um, Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity, and hopefully everyone understands these types of, of food webs. This is certainly not a South African food web, um, because we know that these are not South African, and we wouldn't have this kind of, of web, but that's for where we're going. So for now, if we look at these bottom-up and top-down processes that drive aquatic food webs. And all this, there are two thoughts, that some things are bottom-up driven, so they're driven by nutrients, or they're top-down driven. But essentially, we're looking at a combination of bottom-up and top-down. And in a, in a nice functional um, aquatic ecosystem, if we're going bottom-up, there are these limiting resources, which could be water, nutrients, light, that um, determine the amount of primary production in that ecosystem. And the primary producers, we always think of plants, but being here, I'm sure you all know that there's a lot of plankton, um, phytoplankton, periphyton, and these are very important primary producers for that ecosystem. And then we move up, we've got the herbivores that eat the primary producers, the primary carnivores and the secondary carnivores. So that energy goes from the bottom up. Or we can look at top down where energy flows govern um, by the top-down predators. Here we've got these big um, uh, piscivorous fish. I'm not a fish person. I hope I said that right. 
Um, and they are controlling how many primary carnivores there are, which control how many herbivores there are, which then determine how much of the green stuff is at the bottom. And in our systems, in these very disturbed, anthropogenically disturbed systems, what's happening is we no longer have limiting resources and because of that, we have exponential primary production and we've got an overabundance of often nuisance plants or nuisance algae. So I'm sure you've heard of blue-green algae, um, cyanobacterial blooms, um, submerged aquatic plant invasions or floating aquatic plant invasions. And that's because they are deriving the benefits from unlimited resources. And... South Africa, unfortunately, at the moment, we are drowning in our own sewage. Um, Professor Anthony Turton is quite a, 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 an outspoken person about our failing um, infrastructure and how there are no, there's not a single wastewater treatment plant in South Africa that is 100% compliant with water quality um, guidelines. There's, there's two that are okay, or they, they're quite good, but largely our municipalities are pumping untreated effluent that goes down a catchment either through streams, rivers, or diffuse sources and ends up in um, our rivers. And that is where these unlimiting resources are coming from for the plants to grow. And so we deal with these huge problems. What can we do about it? Well, how about we look at increasing the top-down pressure? So we've got this release or we've got this um, increase in um, bottom-up processes. So let's look at how we can control it from the top down. And that's where biological control comes in. And um, briefly, biological control aims to reunite an invasive species with its natural enemy. So most all those plants that I um, showed you come from the Amazon basin and they arrive in um, their new land, whether it's South Africa or Australia or China, in the absence of those top-down regulators. And because there's this abundance of resources, they grow out of um, control. So biological control then aims to find those natural enemies that regulate them in their native range, bring them introduce them to this invaded range and they in turn are free from their natural enemies and so they can exert a top-down um, pressure on these plants. And we've had excellent success um, with, with aquatic weed biocontrol in Africa, in South Africa, and possibly the best example is um, Azola folliculoides. I didn't show it in those first ones because there's such an amazing biocontrol program against it that we no longer consider it a problem. Does anyone know where this little pond is located? Anyone's worked on the Blowkrans or the Kawi system? This is the, the Blowkrans pool down at the bottom of the, the pass. Um, it's a very important um, spiritual um, uh, spot for, um, for religious reasons. And it was also a one of the last known um, habitats for Sandelia bainesii or the East Coast Rocky. And in the 1990s, early 2000s, this pool was 100% covered with a very thick mat of, of this red water fern. And across the top here, you can see these tracks. And that's where Legavans sort of scrambled across the top or where fish popped out. And through the introduction of this tiny little weevil, and this is work that Martin Hill did um, in the 90s when he first started working um, at plant protection, uh, through the release of this, we now have these beautiful pools that um, native biodiversity can recover. The um, socio-ecological benefits can be derived again. And so biocontrol really does um, promote long-term sustainable um, management of these systems. But then if we go back to our Lake Victoria in the 1990s, these... Um, Water hyacinth is the world's worst aquatic weed. And we have, back in the 90s, there were these two species of biocontrol agents, which are little weevils, and they're pretty much the mainstay of biological control throughout the world. 
And um, this again is a project that Martin worked on with colleagues from Australia and from America to deal with the water lettuce, um, the water hyacinth invasion on, on Lake Victoria. And through training up local communities with very um, low tech, nothing high tech here, it was seagull swimming pools that were imported from South Africa. Seagull Industries wanted to know what on earth um, all these pools were going to, to Lake Victoria for. And here you can see these, um, these guys are local fishermen. They would have been part of a local fishing group. And um, they rearing these insects to release them onto the system. So through a community program, they managed to introduce hundreds of thousands of weevils. And within a year, that top-down pressure managed to um, reduce the amount of water hyacinth on this on Lake Victoria. And I'm going to get it wrong, but I think it was like 200,000 hectares. Is that, I don't get sizes. So I think it was from 200,000 hectares down to 20,000 hectares. And the biocontrol scientists were like, yes, we did this. What an amazing um, feat. And then a paper was published. And um, this is in 2005 by these guys, um, the Americans. They said, why did water hyacinth on Lake Victoria vanish so quickly? And is it going to come back? And they said the reason why it disappeared was in this in 1997, which is when these weevils were released, there was a El Nino um, uh, event, which resulted in a lot of cloud cover, which reduced the amount of PAR, photosynthetic act um, active radiation, and that stopped the plants from being able to photosynthesize. And they correlated this decrease in water hyacinth um, abundance with this reduction in PAR. So the biocontrol scientists said that is absolute rubbish. It was due to biological control by Neocatina species. And here are all the um, top biocontrol scientists in the world at the time who wrote this response. And they said, here you can see, this is hectares of water hyacinth. Um, uh, this, this is old satellite imagery and I can't remember what it would have been. Not Sentinel, Dave, satellite, Landsat. These are Landsat images. And they could work out the amount of um, hectareage of water hyacinth. And they said, here we go. These arrows are where we released the biocontrol agents. The water hyacinth increased. It took time for the biocontrol agents to increase and then it collapsed. So it was clearly biological control. And then these guys came back and said, no, it most definitely wasn't. If we look at where you released your biocontrol agents, which are these lines here, they do not coincide with the declines in when the PAR was at its highest and the water hyacinth does. Essentially, what I'm saying here is, where was the data? No, they, at that time, nobody recorded weevil abundances, nobody recorded plant damage. And so what we really have to work on now is correlation versus causa causation. We know that, that we can't um, deal with that. We need data, we need to collect environmental data. We need to collect biodiversity data. We have to collect plant population data, biocontrol agent population data, economic data, because without data, we can't claim anything. And so the CDC, well, our program started, um, Martin, Martin took over the water weeds program at Rhodes in um, 2005, might be wrong, Martin, 2003. Um, and since then, we've worked really hard to do these post-release evaluations to really show that, yes, biological control does improve biodiversity. It does improve um uh social aspects like access to fishing and here's just some of these um, papers that we've looked at by control of water lettuce facilitates macroinvertebrate biodiversity recovery acornia crassipes by control uh, well the, the presence of the plant reduces macroinvertebrate diversity so obviously controlling it is beneficial um salvinia molester by control drives aquatic ecosystem um recovery etc so we've really worked hard to show, uh, to collect the data to show that it wasn't El Nino. And we've also done um, economic evaluations. This was a student of Martin's and Gareth, Gavin Fraser's, Mary Maluleke, and she looked at 
the um, she evaluated the cost of chemical control, so using herbicides, which are really expensive and damaging, and the cost of biological control. And she worked out benefit cost ratios of using biological control instead of chemical control. And don't worry about all this, just look at the total. This is a benefit cost ratio. So if you use biological control, as opposed to spraying herbicide from a boat, you get a benefit of 90 to one from a bucky, a light truck. So spraying off the back of a bucky, 165. And from a sack, 558 to one. So for every rand spent on, um, biologic, on herbicidal control, you're saving that amount. So you're saving 558 rand. So it's a, it's a benefit cost ratio. So really proving that there are economic benefits to this type of control as well. So if we go back then to what I hyacinth it remains our worst um, aquatic weed in South Africa there we don't we haven't had those kinds of successes that we saw on on Lake Victoria and we really had to look into um, why this is so and in South Africa we've released more biocontrol agents on water hyacinth than anywhere else um, in the world and they do all kinds of feeding damage and if you have a look at a plant that's got all these agents on it it's very damaged and you definitely think it, it should die, but this is what we get in the field. So, so this is a close-up of down here. So heavily damaged plants, lots of insects, but we know that eutrophication limits the success. So we've got that bottom-up driver is way, way, way um, bigger than any top-down um, control that we can exert. In addition, we know that these insects come from the warm tropics. They're used to warm temperatures, not a lot of, of temperature fluctuations. And what do we do? We introduce them to high altitude or and, and cold sites where they're subject to um, much colder winters than they evolved under. And so this climate mismatch between the biocontrol agents and the invasive host plants large, is, is largely responsible in South Africa for limited control, particularly of um, water hyacinth. And we can't do much about the climate. We're trying to do stuff about, we're trying to reduce eutrophication or putting pressure on government. Um, but one of the other things that we could do is let's throw another biocontrol agent into the mix. And some people might say, but they're facing exactly the same issues that the others. So why did you do that? But we did. We released this agent, Megamelis um, scutellaris, in in 2013, and the first site that we oh, the first site that we released it at was the Kabusi River, and that's just um, near uh, Stutterheim, quite close to to Grahamstown. And we released them onto these beautiful green plants in November, so summer, and then that's what happens in the winter time. That is not the result of biological control that is winter that is frosting and so you can imagine those poor insects have now spent the summer probably multiplying um, building up their populations and then bam winter hits and this is one of our coldest biocontrol sites in the country in that um, the winters are very cold and there's not a lot of thermal um, uh, energy available for these insects and but we collected data because we know that data is really important. And Ben Miller did his uh, master's on this and he did, um, he surveyed the site for um, 18 months and he looked at water hyacinth parameters. So in this case, it's water um, bio, um, above water biomass. So that amount of water hyacinth sitting on top of the, the, the mats. And then he also counted the number of megamelis um, per meter squared. And this is May, so we're going start of winter. The water hyacinth was not a lot of, um, the biomass was quite low. But come January, we get this really big increase in um, water hyacinth biomass. So it's it's the prime time for it to, to be growing and, and um, covering that system. Megamelis was around um, fewer than 100 insects per meter squared at the end of winter. Winter came and... There were often times Ben couldn't even find a single megamelis. But then come January, February, March, he started to notice um, an increase in the biocontrol agent population. So they persisted through the winter and they then increased exponentially. And as they started to increase, water hyacinths decreased 
And then they crashed because there was no food left for water hyacinth. And that's a classic biocontrol model. It's a classic predator-prey model. One increases, the other increases, one crashes the other. And we end up with this, this fluctuation. And what he said is we need to mine this gap. Sorry, oops, wrong way. So here we've got the peak of water hyacinth is in January, February, but the insects only peak in, in, in late um, summer and then they die because of winter and it takes a really long time. So what we really need to do is increase the pressure, the top-down pressure early in the season so that we don't get these peaks in the plant um, before the insects can increase. So we thought about this and like, okay, this is what, what we need to do. And we moved across to these very eutrophic, um, hypertrophic, high felt systems. Um, here's Johannesburg down here, there's Pretoria, and we've got Hardebeer's port, uh, Ruda Plot, that's Bon Accord, anyway, um, Falkorp, Ruda Corp. So they're these highly eutrophic systems from untreated effluents. And they're in the high felt, which gets even cold, gets very cold um, winter frosts. And now we want to do biocontrol. And one of these systems was, or is, part of Port Dam. It's been in, in the media quite a lot. Did you know it's South Africa's second biggest tourist hotspot after the VNA waterfront, which I find um, very surprising. But be it as it may, it's a very popular um, place. People live there. People go on holiday there. Um, people fish there that you know it's it's a very popular spot but its water quality is disgusting and it's said to be one of um, perhaps Africa's most hypertrophic um, system and all the bio available biocontrol agents were released there in the 90s but there was a herbicide campaign so these plants were constantly sprayed with um, glyphosate and um Obviously, not every plant gets sprayed. And so we had these little residual pockets of biocontrol agent populations. And in 2018, the CBC was mandated by Environmental Affairs to implement biocontrol. And we were like, you guys are, this is a losing battle. It's a political site. It's highly eutrophic. It's on the high felt. Biocontrol hasn't worked before. You know, we just, we're going to give it a bad name. But nonetheless, we went across to a meeting um, on this day, which was in 2018. We went down to, you can see here these plants, and these are um, satellite, sentinel satellite images. Dave Kinsler sitting in the front has developed an amazing app that um, we can calculate the percent coverage of water hyacinth on water bodies and get these really amazing time series, which I'll show you. And we had a look at these plants and this is what we saw. There were, there was a lot of biocontrol agent damage. Um, and this was largely because the spraying campaign stopped in 2016. So these plants were not sprayed since 2016. This was two years later, and it actually gave the biocontrol agent populations a chance to, to build up because their food wasn't taken away. But what are we sitting with? Abundant resources and not enough of the biocontrol agents. So we decided to um, shift our classical biological control approach to one of an inundative or augmentative approach. And so in 2019, we embarked on this frequent inundative biological control campaign where we um, inundated plants with these mass releases of insects as frequently um, as we could. We have our Vianek mass rearing facility. And if any of you haven't been there and you'd like to go there, Samela um, and Glande Corza are sitting in the front and she manages the facility for us. And all these insects come out of, of this facility. We have a Saison care program, which is for um, people living with disabilities. Um, it was actually started here at, at SIAB. Angus Patterson started it um, initially and then Martin and Angus got chatting and we it um, expanded. And now we have an amazing program up there where um, these guys rear the insects and collect them and we send them um, out for release. And so we were able to, throughout 2019, send these thousands of insects um, to, to Harder Beer Sport. And 29th of September, we were looking at 35% um, percent cover of the dam. Remember, this is springtime. The plants have exploded. The biocontrol agent populations are, are low. By December, 
if we were down to 20% cover. And in January 2020, we went to have a look. We are starting another project there, and we were getting um, reports that these plants had been sprayed with a herbicide, and that, that was illegal. And we went there, and we said, this is not herbicide. If there had been herbicide, all this green stuff, which is not water hyacinth, would be dead as well. And when we had a look, the insects had exploded, not just megamelis, but also the weevils that were there hanging around since the 90s. And by the end of January, we were down to 5% cover of water hyacinth on the dam. And it was something we had, we had never seen before and a phenomenon that's never been, um, been recorded. And we were really pleased with ourselves. And then through COVID, we were able to monitor what was going on. Um, July, in the middle of winter, 1.7%. And yes, obviously, the plant growth is constrained by these cold temperatures. And then October came and we could go, um, COVID restrictions were, were lifted and we could go back. And you have a look here, there's a lot of green. And we went from 1.7% to 9%. So what was going on? Seeds. Water hyacinth produces thousands of seeds that remain viable for a very, very long time. Um, a study we did, we were looking at approximately 2,500 seeds per meter squared. So you can imagine this plant's been on hearty since the 60s, there is an enormous seed bank. And so as soon as warm temperatures, light, no cover of, of previous water hyacinth, these guys just germinate. And so there we had lots and lots of, of seedlings. So that by the end of December that year, we were back up to 42% um, cover. But we didn't give up. We carried on releasing. So Mela carried on sending insects. We set up rearing stations at um, sites around the dam. So people were um, largely these, these very wealthy estates um, set up tunnels that, that some we sponsored, some were set up by themselves. And we managed to rear insects and release them. And so these insects exploded again. And same thing, by the end, by the peak of summer, we were down to 17%. The plants looked terrible. The weevils are nocturnal and they just left the plants um, at night. This was under a, a, a spotlight at one of these estates. Megamela started to swarm. This is the tennis court at this estate where they were rearing insects. The next morning, <laughs> this is what the guy who cleans the court was faced with. Um, and people were angry. They did not appreciate this amount of bugs flying in their faces, landing in their pizzas, apparently biting their children at night, which they can't do. But it was it was a bit of a PR nightmare. And we really had to get out there. These bugs exploding is a good thing. It means those plants are dying and they can, they're no longer getting any from those plants and they will not attack anything else. They're looking for more water hyacinth. And um, yeah, it took a bit of convincing. Um, they're currently doing it again and we're getting all kinds of hate mail again. But um, anyway, by the end of March, we were down to 7%. Peak of summer, water hyacinth below 7% on South Africa's most eutrophic system. And so we realized that by moving from this classical um, approach where you just release a few and hope they do their thing to this augmentative, frequent, inundative approach, we can get control. Don't look at all that blue stuff because that's what happens when you don't treat the symptom. Mm -hmm. But that's what I'm, I'm not about that today. We collected data. We got peaks in water hyacinth, followed by peaks in um, megamelis. And we realized that by increasing that top-down pressure, we really can counter the bottom-up driver of these invasions. Um, this is when we did the majority um, of our releases. We published on it. We said it's a numbers game. If we can inundate these plants, we can get control. But what we do know is we have to shift. We need to get those numbers up much earlier in the season so that we prevent these peaks in water hyacinth. And that's essentially what we've been doing. Um, Dr. Kelby English is my postdoc. Before her was Rosalie Smith. And we set up in this last season nine rearing stations around the dam to rear insects over winter 
So they had to keep the, the stations warm. We had to keep the plants healthy. At times there were no plants because the insects just ate them. And we kept saying, you've got to keep bergamelis growing. We've got to release it as soon as water hyacinth starts to germinate in springtime. And that's what we managed to do. Um, this is this is just come out data. Dave and Colby put this um together for me. So this is la this is the beginning of this year. We had an un a weird peak in water hyacinth cover this year around um, March, April. And it's, don't worry about why. I think we know why, but we got the crash. This is the number of plant hoppers of the Megamelis um, density over, over this time. If we look at where we are now, which is February, we are sitting with nearly 6,000 hoppers per square meters. Whereas in February last year, we weren't even up at a thousand. So this inundative rearing, um, I mean, this rearing over winter and this inundation early in the season really seems to have had an impact because we have not had, where are we? Feb. I'm hoping we don't get this sudden increase, but we won't because these insects have left the plant, the plants are dying, and we know that water hyacinth um, is about to crash. And so we've, really, we've received a lot of um, press about this, um, South African press, the UK Times press, and it's all really because of the work that um, our, our rearing stations do. We couldn't do this without, without the bugs. And so we know that water hyacinth is limited by nutrients. We know that the cold winters influence mortality. We can look at floods. We can look at interference from herbicides, um, their seed banks, but this inundative mass release program um, is is what allows us to exert that really high level of top-down control in the face of these um, bottom-up drivers. But the most important thing is that we can't do it on our own. We can't do it without um, these stakeholders. And, and so this engagement with um, our local communities has been key in the success. Um, and it also obviously offers training and employment. So now the plan is to take this technology to the rest of the world. This is a photo taken earlier this week. There's um, Grant Martin and Ian Patterson. They're with um, our postdoc, uh, Gerald Chikonwere up in, um, this is, oh, I don't know, is it Bulawayo or Harari? I think it's Harari. No, it's Bulawayo. There's two, but anyway, this is a government mesh rearing facility that's rearing megamelis that we sent to them to release onto the systems in Zim and Mega Melis is we've got confirmed establishment. And this was only since um, September last year. So we've got it into Zim. Now we need to go into Zambia, Malawi, Kenya. Um, and we're working hard because there's been a, um, even though there's huge successes in Kenya in the 90s, there's a bit of a um a relaxed, a reluctance to use biocontrol. And so we have to, we're pretty much trying to start again with this importing um process. Our future directions, I've just um, received this chair in um, bio 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 biological control and freshwater alien invasive species management. Um, this was the, the, outcome, the outcome letter, so very lucky to get this. As I said, I work on plants. I work on invasive plants. Thank goodness we've got this incredible um, resource, biological invasions in South Africa, and Ola Vail led this chapter on alien freshwater fauna in South Africa. So I've got a good solid base um, and understanding of what else is out there impacting our systems. Um, together with Sam Mutitswe, Josie Pegg, um, Tatenda at Tatenda Dalu at Mpumalanga, Ryan Wasserman at, at Rhodes, Nelson Miranda at um, uh, NMU, and, 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 we can start tackling these or, or continue tackling because these guys have done a lot of the work already and now to put it under this um, research umbrella I think will will really help us to to get on top of it. Uh, uh, Siva here, yes, Siva Khaleesi is working on these, um, how do you say it, Sanotea, Sanotia, um, at Zoo Lake. It's a Chinese snail observed at Zoo Lake, hugely invasive. Terebia granifera has invaded the coast of KZN, we don't know how much further down or up it is. This um this was on the 20th of February on Twitter. 
Red claw crayfish, an alien base of species, is making its way rapidly through the fresh waters of Kruger National Park. And this is work that Josie South did. And um, we know that this crayfish is already in uh, Zimbabwe, it's in Zambia. And then, of course, there's the whole fish layer, which is what a lot of you guys here work on. And so we have a lot of expertise. And um, there's not, yeah, there's Nompo Malelo, who is about to hopefully start um, a PDP uh, postdoc where she's going to look at unveiling this tangled web so we can look at things in isolation. But if we really want to get an understanding, yeah, we've got a nice um, look at what happens if an invasive fish arrives, but what's happening with the plants, with the floating plants, what's happening with um, trophic cascades, what's happening, what's happening with global climate change. And so we've done some baseline stuff, but how do we get this all together. And that's what Pumi is going to um, unravel for us. Oh, oh what a high, so it always appears last. <laughs> what does it do? Um, and then luckily we've already started on a group of invasives that um, I hadn't really considered. Ryan Busserman came to talk to me about it. And then Emily Strange, who's sitting in the audience, um, she did her PhD here at Rhodes and is now at Leiden University, also started talking about mosquitoes invasive mosquitoes and what we what what emily spearheading has what role could the spread of invasive floating plants have on um mosquito communities so in europe they're getting the same aquatic invasive plants invading as it's getting warmer and warmer these plants are getting further and further north mosquitoes their invasion patterns are follow are, are fairly similar so uh, is there some kind of interaction facilitation um, is that happening in South Africa as well? And we've got a couple of postgrad students who are going to be um, tackling this. And we've got a lot of um, uh, expertise in the forms of Martin, Martin, <laughs> Martin Schrammer, uh, Ryan, there's uh, Teresa sitting here, Flomelos here, Tracy is here, and then Michiel, um, Emily's colleague. And we're really going to look, try, this is our first um, sort of, interaction between invasive plants and invasive um, biota that we're looking at. And yeah, so many um, exciting opportunities. I think right at the beginning, I keep thinking, oh my gosh, we haven't done enough yet, but it's two months in. So um, if anyone has cool aquatic invasive um, ideas, there'll be bursaries, we've got running costs and um, yeah, just come and come and chat. And uh, I think the future is, is, is invasion global change so thank you thank you very much thank you so much julie <laughs> can see already uh i'm not sure lucky what are we doing we're taking online or we're you. taking you can do the house <laughs> Let's start. There was a hand over there. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, this. Good question, Ferdy. So the, the question is, in the 70s, we sprayed um, herbicides on water hyacinth, disappeared, but then we got these huge um, algal blooms of, of macrocystis, which is this blue-green algae, cyanobacteria. And um, no, we aren't seeing these huge blooms. So in two, between 2008 and 2010, nobody wanted a home at Harder Beer Sport because it was blue and stank and people were getting sick um, and that that continued water hyacinth produces allelo chemicals that are known to um, suppress blue green algae so that's probably this this dynamic and you get rid of the the water hyacinth you get an increase in the blue greens and um, we're trying to test it so is Tracia and um, we're trying to test this whole allelo chemical thing if there's biocontrol of the plant, but populations still remain, it almost seems like those, this is untested, this is a theory, that those allelo chemicals remain in the system and we're not seeing those um, algal blooms. At Rotoplot Dam, currently, they they have a, an intensive spraying um, campaign. 
and there's blue-green algae. There's no water hyacinths, so there is blue-green algae. And it's there because of the nutrients. It's there because of the sewage. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, no, 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 we still, we're, we're way above one milligram, yeah. To be fair now, there's lots of questions coming in, so <laughs> I'm going to alternate. Uh, Michael Elliott, but what about the unintended consequences of releases? There are enough examples worldwide of biological control misfiring and the introduced controls then becoming habituated, naturalized and attacking indigenous species. The economic costs then expand. Thank Michael you. Elliott, I'm not sure what examples you're talking about. There's not a single example of an aquatic, I mean, not aquatic, of a weed biological control agent um, exerting unintended consequences. If there were, um, if, if you're talking about the uh, thistle and rhinocillus that went on to native thistles in Canada, these were anticipated. There's no unintended consequences. Um so yeah, give us the, the examples. If you're talking about cane toads, those are mammalian that were introduced to um, eat um, uh, cane borer and this kind of biocontrol uh, does not happen. Um, weed biocontrol is safe. It's um, the insects are host specific and would never release anything um, that we knew would target something else. Then I'm going in house. Can you just be either coming close or be very, very loud with your question to let? Uh, be loud. Okay. Uh, yeah, really great talk. So um, I think you sort of pretty question and you sort of went to a little bit later in terms of like tropic cascades and once you drop the, you, the nutrients have to go somewhere. So as soon as you, even whether it's the insects that kill it or the spray, the nutrients are not go going anywhere. Something else will come into the ecosystem to take up that exactly. nutrient. So how is it, is it, are there any examples where you can actually you harvest biocontrol agents at the peak of their, when, when they bash down the, Think bash down their um their, their, their host and then actually remove those nutrients. So almost in the same way that suggested that big swarms of locusts or trans nutrient tra transfer nutrients across ecosystems in Southern Africa, is there not something to thought about, for example, the lights at right at the end, really big lights and attract all those insects before they die on winter on the water and go sink to the bottom and basically yeah. neutrifies it yeah. to actually collect those. Like that, 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 the nutrients and it, the thanks it's a good question alex and um something that a lot of people raise um so yes we're talking about removing those nutrients well first of all the amount of nutrients coming into especially part of beer sport is is order of 10 magnitudes higher than what the plants are taking out of the water and what then what the insects are adding yeah. so there's a study um where they did a mass balance of the, the, the nutrient inputs, the nutrients in the dam, the nutrients going out the dam, and then they looked at what water hyacinth um, could take up. And so just remember, water hyacinth is taking up what's already there. When it dies, it's not adding, it's yes. just yeah. what was there. Um, and it can take up at best zero, at, at maximum cover, at maximum uptake, 0.1% of the phosphorus that's coming in to the system. So if we look then at removing those insects, that's going to be like, yeah. We have to solve the nutrients. Okay, that's um, online, Meba Poyana. The case in Kenya, what happened to the insect after they cleared the plants on the lake? Any ecological changes on the native biodiversity? She later also compliments and your work and say, please come help uh, Zambia side. Okay. Um. So what happened to the insects? The insects died. When there's no food for these insects, when the water hyacinth dies, the insect dies. If Salvinia molested dies, its biocontrol agent, which is not the same as the one for water hyacinth, dies. So mm -hmm. these insects have got a very, very close host-specific relationship with the invasive plant, and they cannot complete their life cycles um, on anything else. They can't feed on anything else. And what happened to native biodiversity, while well, there was no impact from the insect and native biodiversity within Lake Victoria um, recovered. So there are a lot of studies showing the um, what water hyacinth does to the biodiversity of Lake Victoria, and then in its absence, what, um, what recovers. Any question in house? Yes? Roger, you need to be loud or come here. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, all the okay, we looked at the impact of all the um rotting vegetation on native biodiversity. Well, no, we haven't, and there's a huge um there's a there's a, a feeling at the moment that all of this water hyacinth is creating a sludge layer at the bottom of the dam and what's that doing um the action of biological control is is slow it's a slow process so it's not like a herbicide application where you'd get the sudden sinking anaerobic conditions rotting um, um sulfur so it's, it's a it's a much slower process so we would think that that amount of biomass going into the system um, would be dealt with by those anaerobes or, or detritivores um, that are there, and perhaps they are increasing them. But the short answer is no, we haven't looked at it, but I do have a master's student who is currently um, working on that. Then I've got a question here online, Peter Ackle. Thanks for the presentation, Julie. I'm impressed that insect-based control for water hyacinth seems to work, but the amount of nutrients released from the huge biomass dying certainly shifts the tropic level of the system, creating new problems. Do you think the approach may not necess necessarily be sustainable? And what are the recommendations to reduce unforeseen nutrient input? It's linked to Rogers. Yeah. Alex was saying, yeah. so yeah. It's not adding nutrients. It's 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 taking nutrients up from a system and they're going back into the system. We have to stop those nutrients coming into the system from the out at the outset. And there's a lot of um, uh, a movement towards removing that biomass. So let's let's physically remove the water hyacinth so that it takes the nutrients away. But in reality, when you if you're dealing with a small garden pond. And you've got a, um, uh, I don't know, a settling pond. You've got some sewage going into it. Yes, water hyacinth on that system can take up a lot of those nutrients and help purify it. We are dealing with systems that are so polluted that, as I said, it's fractional the amount of nutrients that water hyacinth is taking up in comparison to what's coming in. So Joburg municipalities, Victoria municipalities really have to fix their wastewater treatment works and um, become compliant and then we'll start to see impact on, on water quality. But it's not through these invasive plants. Any other question in house? Because there's another one here. And then I've got one. Hello, I'm Siseko Yelani from Tanzania Township near East London. We have a huge problem of water hyacinth in the Brittle Drift Dam, which is the main water source for the entire metropolitan. It seems like the local municipality is not bothered by this. Can we have access to similar research data as we're trying to create employment through water hyacinth? We have created bio coal from it and we want to do other products. Um, yes, Siseko. Uh, we do know about Bridal Drift Dam. We have um, Mega Mellis got there by itself. Uh, we released on Lang Dam and the Yellowwoods River, which is further upstream. And so it seems as though these insects, um, there was a big flood, plants came down, insects came down, and um, and we know that they can disperse. So Mega Mellis is there, but we don't have this kind of mass rearing um, campaign there. And it's perhaps something that we that we need to look at doing. So getting the local community to, to rear these insects um, to for release on the dam, I think is, is a really good idea. In terms of making bio, um, bio coal, it's a good idea. Um, the, the amount of biomass of this plant makes everyone say, well, surely we can do something with it. Can't we make textiles? Can't we make biogas? Can we make coal? Um, you name it. Um, we don't promote that because we don't want to promote the use of such an invasive, problematic species. Um, but certainly, you know, if if can find applications, if you can find an application, I'm not going to say you know I don't have the right to say no, but it is illegal to to harvest and grow this plant without permits. So it's it's all a bit of a nightmare. The big thing is we need to get rid of it by sorting out water quality. One final question online. Is the competition between local aquatic insects and biological control insects? Thank you for your work. There isn't because there are no local aquatic insects that um, feed on water hyacinth. So there is no competition. Can I ask a question? Um, when you just have that mass release, isn't anything else eating these bugs? I thought like opportunistically if there's food there's food exactly so it, again it's one of the things that that we do need to look at going forward 
surely these thousands of insects are going to have some kind of impact on what can feed on them. So we're looking at going up through the through the trophic system. And certainly if you go to Harder Beer Sport and look in a patch, there are spiders and earwigs and mm -hmm. um, the birds are all over the show. So yes, there must be some kind of um, I guess apparent competition effects that we that that we not or, or, or biodiversity um effects um that we're looking at. But these would be temporary yeah. um, because of the, the amount of time that the plant stays on the system. Yeah. And also opportunistic. There's no more question. Oh, yeah. Nice work. Um, Raffaella Zorza. I work on diatoms in Italy. Very interested also on this part of the ecosystem fundamental for the bottom up and top down control of the resources and used uh, as indicator uh, for monitoring of eutrophication. Any study on this component? I think the yeah, money diatoms. Yeah. Diatoms. Um, we do look at diatoms. So, so we look at um, we don't use the diatom um, scoring system or the the diatom indicator system, but we do use diatom biodiversity mm -hmm. as as a um indi uh, uh, yeah as an indicator of biodiversity um recovery, and that's a lot of work that Sam Otitswe does. Um, uh, Lulama, I mean Luluto, who's not here, she's in Joburg. She looks at these diatoms, these phytoplankton, um, under conditions of uh, hundred percent cover, biocontrol, no um, cover, and we can look at how diversity changes. Thank you so much. Improves areas. That's it. Where? Oh, six new messages, guys. Oh. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to pick one and that's it. Um, uh, ba, 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 okay, there's Zama Dube Dube. Hi, Prof. Thank you so much for the informative presentation. There has been claims that aquatic plants could be used as fertilizer or compost. Are there any potential negative impact on the soil since this plant could be hyper accumulators? Yeah, that's a, a good question. There is a company that does make um, fertilizer from, from water hyacinth. It takes up heavy metals, it, which is what Frank um, Butte is working on. Um, it takes up, what well, we don't know, it probably takes up microplastics. What we, it does take up micro, microplastics. Is it taking up hormones? Then we further, we, we may be mulching this all up and then we're putting it on our agricultural systems. Are we then just putting loads of toxic compounds onto our system. So yes, it's a good question. Um, I think if they're in such filthy systems, I would definitely steer clear of using them for anything. Um, definitely don't feed them to your pigs or cows <laughs> or yourself. And with that, I'd like to invite everyone to give another round of applause for me. Thank you for to our online um, uh, audience and to the audience in house. And I'm sure the people in house can engage further with Julie. I'm sure a lot of you have got more questions. Not the CBC because you know it all. Thank you.